your life. And Father, we thank you for all your many blessings. Father, we love you. And we thank you for your son. And we thank you for your love. And we thank you for your patience with us. And we pray that you would continue to please have patience with us. We are imperfect, Father. We know we fall. We know we stumble. And we pray that you would have patience with us, God. Father, we pray that you would strengthen us and that you would guide us through our lives to do your will always. I thank you for the Bremen congregation and that you would be with it and that you would continue to help it grow and that you would be with each of, each of its members and that you would guide them through their lives to always make the right decisions, both physically and spiritually, and to do your will always. Father, again, I thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us. Forgive us of our sins, Father. This we pray in your Son's name. Amen. So thankful to be able to be here and say good morning to you and welcome to our Bible study period for the Bremen Church of Christ on this Lord's Day. If you are a visitor among us, we are especially glad to have you with us today. We'll dismiss now with the nursery preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. <clears throat> Middle school, high school, and adults. We, uh, we've been looking at alleged Bible discrepancies. We looked last week at a few. We ran out of time before we got through all the ones that I had. But we were looking at discrepancies or, or alleged Bible discrepancies as they pertain to the resurrection of Jesus. <clears throat> we left off, get my remote on here. I believe with, sir, it's not, uh, do you see a folder on the desktop there that says Chad PPT drop? Should be in there. It'll start with 07, the file name will. Uh, we, we, were, we finished up talking about was the tomb open or closed? And the way Matthew's account is written, and some, some people interpret it to say that, uh, for, interpret him to be saying that the tomb was closed when they got there. And of course, it's, it's just a misunderstanding of what Matthew is saying there. And, uh, and it's also a failure to indicate, sometimes remember, and I've got a note, um, I think it's actually in the new lesson for today, uh, once, we get, once we finish up with the alleged discrepancies surrounding the resurrection. Uh, did you find it? Got it? Okay. Uh, there we go. But there's a note in here today um, in one of these where keep in mind that, and, and this is especially true with the gospel accounts, and I would have to go back and look to, to say this with 100% certainty, but if I remember correctly, it's also especially true with Luke as pertains to the gospel accounts. They are many, many times more concerned with the topic than they are the chronology. A lot of times we, we tell things and we are, we're so careful. We want to get the timeline established. But then again, you talk to somebody else and they may tell you everything completely out of order and they may say something and no doubt many of us have talked to someone or maybe you are a person like that, who somebody stops you mid-sentence and says, hold, hold on, who's Sally? Oh, well, that's, 
And then they just tell you, well, it's completely out of order. Or sometimes they may be saying something and it may, may be a writing and they're not necessarily interacting with someone, but uh, you are telling something, typing it out or writing it out, and you mention something and then you realize as the writer, oh, I didn't, I didn't explain that or whatever. So maybe you then say, okay, this is the person who, or this is what this situation came about as a result of. Well, you're telling things completely out of chronological order, but you're not concerned with chronology. You're trying to tell a story. And so keep in mind, when you come to the gospel accounts, they're not trying to give always, now sometimes they are in certain sections, but they're many times not at all concerned with chronology. They're telling a story. They're telling the story of Jesus. Who is this man that the many, many people, and it was spreading at that time when the gospel accounts were written, Christianity is growing, it's growing. Uh, many times they're being persecuted. Who are these people? Why are they willing to die for this man named Jesus? Who was this man named Jesus? And so, lest anybody be mistaken as to who he was, these gospel accounts were written. They're concerned with telling the story of Jesus, not making sure every single event is in chronological order. So it would be silly for us to come to them and expect every single thing to be, okay, here's what happened at uh, 8 o'clock on the 1st, and then you move on into later day on the 1st, and then on the 2nd, here's what happened. They may throw something out that happened on the 30th, and then come later, and, and you'll see this in some of these alleged Bible discrepancies. And again, it amazes me, never ceases to amaze me, how folks can understand that reading every other piece of literature in this world. But they come to the Bible, and something is told out of sequence, and they go, well, there's a contradiction. This thing can't be the Word of God, can't be accurate, because this is completely out of order. That's not always how people uh, write or, or speak, for that matter. <clears throat> but let's, let's look at this. Uh, I think I have two of these that were left over from last week dealing with the resurrection. Matthew 28, 8, later part of that verse, you see where they, they ran, these women ran to bring his disciples' word, to, to tell the disciples, in other words, about the resurrection. Um, really, you can drop down to Luke 24 here and get it first. They told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. But then in Mark's account, they went out quickly, fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. So, the skeptic comes to this and he says, well, were they silent or did they tell somebody? And some of these, again, you know, I say this a lot because it's true. Some of these are ironic that they've ever been presented as a as supposed discrepancy because if we read it anywhere else, we would have no question. For instance, we talked about, you know, was it dark when they came to the tomb, as John says? Was it beginning to dawn on the first day of the week, as one of the gospel account writers says? Or was it very early in the morning? Well, you know, the answer to that question is yes. It was all of those. It was very early in the morning, right as day was beginning to dawn, but it was still, what we would say, basically dark. If you've ever gotten up early to go on a trip or to go hunting or, or whatever, then you know that there is this, that certain hour or certain time of the morning when the sun is just beginning to dawn, we would probably say, most folks would say, it's still dark. We wouldn't say it's daylight out there, but at the same time, you can still see there's, there's some, um, I guess you'd call it twilight there. Well, <clears throat> if we read that in any other book, we would understand the writer's just trying to say it's very early in the morning, right as the sun is just beginning to rise, but it's not day yet. Yet people come to the gospel accounts and they say, look, here's a contradiction. So some of these are, are almost foolish, but... They have been brought up, and so that's one reason we're looking at them, because we want to make sure we understand and also make sure that if, you know, maybe that you're talking to somebody and they say, hey, here's something that uh, I can't get past this, and I have a problem with this, and I think this, this renders the Bible errant and, and therefore not worthy of being a guide for our lives. Also, remember, and I, I was thinking about this last night. I don't know that I've said this yet. Sometimes, um, well, pretty much all of these, we have squeezed the discussion of a particular supposed discrepancy into one PowerPoint slide in a few minutes during each class. Remember that it may take five minutes or, or five seconds, literally sometimes, for somebody to say, here's your contradiction in your Bible. And it may take a long time to analyze that, to study it, and determine, okay, here's what really happened. Even in my case, 
I'm, I'm boiling it down to a slide of a PowerPoint presentation to try to condense it all and get it into one space, but it takes some time to read through and study through, and I have the benefit of a book. I'm using, I've mentioned before, Eric Lyon's wonderful book called The Anvil Rings. Uh, I've, he has, that book is nothing but alleged Bible discrepancies, and, and the times, uh, the, the amount of time that Eric has put into that, there's no telling. Uh, because you can tell he did his homework, he's very thorough, a lot of study has gone into that book. I'm benefiting from that, and of course we're all benefiting from that in this class. But sometimes we take for granted when we look at these and we boil it down to a, a simple explanation, but coming to that simple explanation is not always easy. And, and so there, there's one that I have, and I, I, there's no way we'll be able to cover it this week, and I, I, I probably am not going to... Uh, cover it at all, not because it's, it's not a good one, but because it, it, there's just so much detailed um, detail that we'd have to get into and, and number crunching and things like that, but it deals with the Israelite sojourn in Egypt, looking at passages in Acts, Genesis, Exodus, uh, and, and even another passage in there, uh, Chronicles. But people say, well, there's a discrepancy there, but there's not. But it literally, I was looking in, in Eric's book, and I've got a copy of it here, you're talking right at 12 pages to discuss that alleged Bible discrepancy. That's, that's what it takes to get into this and uh, examine it and understand, okay, there's not a discrepancy here, but sometimes you've got to do some digging. And many times that's because of the transmission of the text down through time, where it was, we've noticed already there might be a little smudge on a scroll or a tear on a scroll and might, might just be bad lighting or poor eyesight on the part of a scribe, and they just miscopy something. Sometimes it's just something that simple, but that's not an easy thing to figure out. Once you figure it out, you go, oh, okay, that's a copyist error. A clear, clear as day, that's got to be a copyist error. But getting to that conclusion many times takes a lot of time. So I don't want to sound like we're oversimplifying some of these things because some of these are not, not that easy to figure out. Some of them are, but some are not. But what about this? Situation with the silence. Somebody look up Isaiah 53, verse 7, please. <clears throat> Who's got it? Okay, go ahead. All right, he was silent, he opened not his mouth. So here, here's the question that we want to ask in, in relation to this. Did Jesus ever speak? Well, of course he did. He did a lot of teaching while on this earth, did he not? The statement is not characteristic of his entire ministry, but rather of his trial and his crucifixion. And yet we would further ask, at his trial and crucifixion, was he completely silent? No. He spoke on one point. Are you, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says what? Do you say this thing of yourself or does somebody else tell you? And, and so he interacts with Pilate some. Well, he was speaking uh, on one occasion before the high priest. Thou sayest it. Uh, it. It is as you say is the way some translations put it. Um, Hereafter you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. You know, it up, that upset them greatly. So it wasn't completely silent even during his trial and crucifixion. But there was a particular time period during which he remained silent. As they're accusing him, as they're beating him, as they're mocking him, he's silent. As opposed to someone who might constantly be saying, look, y'all stop this, I'm innocent, I'm the savior of the world, I haven't committed a single sin, I'm, I'm here for you all, stop, don't do this. Over and over and over someone might cry that, and, and, and understandably so. But Jesus... It was almost as if he says, you know what, I've, I've been on this earth for 33 years. I've been teaching nonstop for three years. I think my body of work speaks for itself. They're going to do what they're going to do. They had determined they were going to kill him. And so he remains silent. And, of course, it's the parallel of a lamb going to the slaughter because he is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But, you know, it's not saying that he never spoke. We understand, understand that when we look at Isaiah 53, 7. Well, coming back to these gospel accounts, that's 
That's what this is referring to. It's a particular time period. The passages contradict only if the writers are talking about the exact same time frame, which clearly they are not. Somebody may say, well, yeah, I think they are. Well, there's no way that we could prove that these writers are trying to discuss the exact same time period. There's no way that we would even reasonably assume that they were talking about the same time period. You know, again, if someone wrote that here's a person who remained silent and told no one and then a few sentences later or maybe in another letter to another friend says, oh, he went out and told the friends of this fellow, we would understand and I think we would assume even that different time periods were under consideration. So it is here. Basically what happens is they're initially afraid, they're silent, as Mark records, then later that same day they broke their silence and they went and told others. You know, initially, they're, they're terrified. They don't know what to make of this. They see, you know, clearly he's risen from the dead. What, you know, you can almost picture them saying, have we seen a ghost? Is this really happening? We saw him hang on the cross. We saw the Roman soldier pierce his side. They said he's dead. They took him down. They put him in the tomb. They, Joseph wrapped his body, prepared it for the burial. All this we saw, we know that happened. And now the tomb is empty. We, we've seen him. And so you can imagine there's a period of time where they're just, they're not telling anybody anything. And then, okay, this, this is real. And we need to go and we need to tell others. Um, Mark 16, 10. Brother Robert, can you get that? They actually were told to tell others eventually. All right, so she went out and told them as they were mourning, they were weeping. So, you know, eventually they break their silence. But initially, they're afraid, they're silent. So you're just talking about different time periods. And, and this is one that, you know, again, I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but it's pretty easy to understand when we get in our mind that this is different periods of time. And yet, sometimes people come to the Bible and they're, they're seeking to find something and so they, they latch on to something like that. Yes, sir, Brother Gary. That's the reason that it, it seemed like they didn't, they didn't say anything to anybody until they told the other, the eleven. Yeah. Until they, were, they, were, they didn't speak to any man until they got to tell the other. And that was something, yeah, thank you, I forgot to mention, that was something I thought about too, is that they may have said to themselves, we've got to go talk to the, the apostles. Uh, th this is, you know, is this really happening? We've seen it with our own two eyes. Let's go talk to the apostles. Let's don't say a word to anybody until we go talk to the apostles. And that, that does seem to be uh, exactly what's going on here. And, and the, the other ones that you had up there, it sounded like, you know, they didn't say anything either until they got to the 11th. You know, they, right. They didn't run to bring his disciples the word. Yeah, they go to bring the disciples' word. They told the 11th and then the rest. Yeah. So that's a good point. That, you know, they say, look, we're going to go talk to the the 11 disciples, and of course, why 11? Judas yeah, Judas is dead at that point. He, he hanged himself. So they say, look, we're going to go talk to the apostles, and, and then they begin to, to tell other folks. Uh, even the, the apostles, where were they meeting after the resurrection? They were meeting in this, this room with the doors closed, John says. Why? Why were the doors closed? For fear of the Jews. So there was, there was still a lot of, you know, iffy, iffy, kind of an iffy situation, I guess we could call it. They didn't really know what to make of this at first, uh, which kind of brings us to the next uh, supposed discrepancy, Galilee or Jerusalem. Here are our passages. Jesus says, after I'm risen, I will go before you into Galilee. He said that in Matthew 26 before he was crucified. Then on resurrection day in Matthew 28, you have this angel telling them, "Go, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. So let's be around Jerusalem. Um, then later on in Matthew uh, 28, this will be verse 10, Jesus says, be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. And then... Uh, I think that last verse is supposed to be 16. I don't have a number there, but I think this... I think starting with 
then, that's verse 16, then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Uh, then you come to Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but Jesus says, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. So somebody says, well, which is it? I mean, is it Galilee? Is he going to meet him in Galilee or is he going to meet him in Jerusalem? Well, the answer to that is yes, uh, both. There are, there are different times, again, under consideration. Jesus was on the earth about 40 days after his resurrection, according to Acts 1-3. Let's look at Acts 1-3. Who's got it? Brother Ricky, go ahead. Okay, so 40 days after the resurrection, or you know, about 40 days, he's on the earth. On resurrection day, <clears throat> he meets with all the apostles, minus Thomas, of course, and of course... I think it goes without saying, as we've already said, minus Judas, who was dead at that point. But Thomas was not there for whatever reason in Jerusalem. This is recorded by Luke in Luke 24, 33 to 43. It's also recorded by John, John chapter 20, because later Thomas will be there. And, of course, John records where Jesus says, you know, behold my hands and my side. Uh, so that was on resurrection day. But then sometime between this first meeting and his ascension, he met with seven of the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias in Galilee. John records this in John 21. Remember, they're out fishing. Peter says, I go a-fishing. And he says, have you caught any fish? They say, no, I haven't caught any fish. He says, well, cast your nets on the other side. And what happened? They can't, can barely bring it all in. You know, they're hauling in this load of fish. Uh, John actually gives us the number, 153 fish. They, Peter says, it is the Lord. He jumps right into the sea and swims to shore to go and see Jesus. So that's between this first meeting and his ascension. Later, he met with all 11 apostles on an appointed mountain in Galilee, Matthew 28, 16. And so that's where he's saying, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. It doesn't say that I will meet you in there and I will not see you until then. He, he didn't say that. I may say some of the young uh, or, or some of the young or old couples, I guess for that matter, or in between as we might be. <laughs> We might be going to this uh, marriage retreat up in Pigeon Forge in a few weeks. And we may say, uh, I might say on Wednesday night before then, say, I'm going to meet you in Pigeon Forge. Don't forget. I may even say to Reagan, maybe she's on the phone with somebody, say, hey, tell them we're going to meet them up there in Pigeon Forge at the, uh, the Holiday Inn Conference Center or whatever where they have this uh, marriage seminar. All right? Well, what if the next day we see them somewhere else? Or what if we say, you know what, we, we're going we're gonna to ride with them. And so we go to their house or, or we say we're going to drop something off real quick, you know. Whatever the case may be. Maybe a thousand different reasons where we might go see them before then. They, you know, no one would think, well, there's, there's a discrepancy in what, what Chad said and what Chad and Reagan said before and now. We understand that, yes, there is a set time in which we're going to meet up there in Pigeon Forge. In between, it's not saying well, we're not going to see you at all. We're not going to interact with you in any way, shape, form, or fashion in between now and then. You know, again, we, we, in real life situations, we would have no problem with this. But people come to the gospel accounts looking for problems and they say, oh, I, I don't know about that. So he met with them later on an appointed mountain in Galilee. Sometime following, Jesus and the disciples traveled back to Judea where he ascended from the Mount of Olives near Bethany. And that's Luke 24 and also Acts 1. 9 to 12. He actually may have appeared to the disciples a number of different times. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 7, you know, Paul, Paul lays out several appearances to various ones there in those, well, it's actually, he, he begins talking about it in about verse 5 of that chapter. So he actually may have appeared several times to the disciples. We know Luke 24, if you want to get to Luke 24, if you're already in Acts from, from reading Acts 1, 3, you'll, you'll be right there at Luke. No, I'm sorry. Luke is continued by Acts, but there is a book in between, John. But Luke 24, we know that 50 to 53 did not take place on Resurrection Day. We know that because of Acts 1, 1 to 12. So when he's, 
when he's leading them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands, blessed them, and of course he eventually ascends into heaven from there. We know that's not taking place on Resurrection Day. That's, that's afterward, about 40 days afterward, actually. But what about verses 44 to 49? Sometimes people have uh, a question about that, you know, where Jesus is uh, talking to them and, uh, you know, it lines up with Acts 1. They, sometimes people say, well, it says here it's on Resurrection Day. It does not. There's no timetable given. There's no indication it was on the same day that Jesus rose from the dead. And, and here's where I was mentioning. Remember, Bible writers are more often concerned with the topic at hand than the chronology of it. Luke does not say one way or the other, did this happen on the day Jesus rose from the dead or did it not? Putting it with Acts 1, it's pretty clear it did not happen on the day he rose from the dead. It happened on the same day that he ascended back into heaven. Uh, and there's, there's some interesting things about the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts anyways because it appears that they were originally, or, or well, there's some evidence at least that at one time they were, I don't know if I'd say one work, but at least attached. And it seems at some point they kind of got separated into the Gospel of Luke and then the, uh, I guess you call it the letter or epistle of Acts. It's not really an epistle. It's you know, way, the way the New Testament epistles are addressed to specific individuals or churches. But you can tell these were, these were meant to be one. Luke's giving the Gospel account, and then he begins to give this detailed history of the church. And so... Some of this where, where it was separated, there's, there's some, some question as far as the um, wording of it. But it, it's clear Luke's not giving any kind of a timeline or timetable in the last, in those verses, what, 44 to 49 of Luke 24. But it clearly didn't happen on the same day that Jesus rose from the dead. So there's no discrepancy here. It's just different times under consideration. Does that, does that cover that? I thought I saw some. Sometimes you look out and you, you see people doing this. You think, oh, am I, am I not explaining that very well? <laughs> but uh, sometimes things make sense to me and they don't necessarily communicate across. So I want to make sure we, we get that covered. Anything else on that? All right. So that, that's all, that's, that covers the ones I had dealing with the resurrection. This one kind of answers um, two, two questions in one about meeting them in Galilee or in Jerusalem and where Jesus tells them to tarry in Jerusalem, whereas he had told them up here several different places to go into Galilee, go into Galilee. Uh, the disciples went away into Galilee, but then you've got Jesus telling them to tarry in Jerusalem. Well, somebody says, well, why is that? That's, that doesn't make sense. You know, he says, he says, go to Galilee. He says, tarry in Jerusalem. Well, it's different times. They were to go to Galilee to meet him. Then later, 40 days after his resurrection, he's addressing them, and he says, stay in Jerusalem until you've been endued with power from on high, which, of course, happened when? Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. So uh, that, that covers two supposed discrepancies kind of in one there. All right. Um, well, I didn't know we'd take that long to cover those. We've got a few minutes. All right, let's look at some alleged discrepancies pertaining to time. How long was the ark, particularly the ark of the covenant, in Kerjath jerem First Samuel 7, verse 2, the ark abode in Kerjath Jerem. Uh, it came to pass while the ark abode in Kerjath Jerem that the time was long, for it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. 2 Samuel 6, 2 says, David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Bala of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God. Now, what's the problem with those two? See if anybody can put your thinking cap on and figure this out without me telling you. Why is that at least on the surface, appear to be a discrepancy. When is, when is 1 Samuel 7 2? When is that taking place? Test your Old Testament overview here. Remember, we, we, we talked about our divided, we divided the Old Testament into 12 periods. 1 Samuel 7 would fall into the period of Let's say you got before the flood, after the flood, patriarchal, bondage in Exodus, um, conquest and possession is number six. What's in between conquest and possession? Wilderness, Wilderness wanderings, thank you. Um, conquest and possession, and then what? 
Judges, which goes to 1 Samuel 8. So this is happening when? During the period of the Judges, right? In fact, it happens during Samuel's life. It's, it's near the end of his life. Uh, it's very late in the period of the Judges. The Israelites, they thought, uh, they had kind of treated the ark as a magical uh, lucky charm. We were, we're losing in battle. Somebody go get the ark. No wonder we're losing. We don't have our lucky charm. And God says, you know, it doesn't work that way. You, you get right with the Lord, and the ark represents his presence among you when you're right with the Lord. It's not a lucky charm that you can do whatever you want, live however you want, and then bring it into battle, and suddenly you're going to win the battle. So they lost the battle. Not only did they lose the battle, they lost the ark. And the ark was taken. And the Philistines carried it. And, of course, it's, uh, it's interesting to read about all the physical maladies that the uh, Philistines suffered as a result of having the ark. But the ark got taken. And so it's, it's there encouraging Jeremiah. All right, so it's, it's during the period of Samuel, the, the, the judges. So what? Why, why does that present a problem? For it to say that it abode and encouraged us during 20 years. Right. And so 20 years, David goes and gets it. But, but still, what's the problem there? Again, remembering our Old Testament overview, first three kings of Israel were Saul, David, Solomon. How long did they reign? Each one was, somebody said it, 40 years. 40, 40, 40. So now why is there a problem? Now do you see it? If this is before Saul even began to reign and the ark stayed there 20 years, well, wait a minute. Saul reigned 40 years and David, even if it's in the beginning of his, of his reign, he went to bring the ark from thence 20 years later? Well, he wouldn't even be king. It'd be Saul. So how do you... This was one that is it's kind of ironic because I was thinking of uh, something, I was, I was going through some files on my computer the other day and I ran across this. I've had it literally, uh, let's see, we've been married 11 years, so I've had this about 15 years. I've, I've mentioned before, um, there was a guy that he sent an email to, he, he, back in several years ago, you could send an email, at least at Faulkner, I don't know if other schools had this, uh, and it was abused many times and so it's since been fixed. But you could send an email and Brian and some of y'all probably remember this, students at faulkner.edu, and you would hit every student's mailbox with that email. Well, this preacher turned atheist, missionary turned atheist, Farrell Till, uh, he decided he was going to send out his propaganda on how the Bible's full of errors, there is no God, the, the Bible's completely wrong, and uh, all this stuff. And so he sends a whole bunch of attachments and he sends it to that student set, faulkner.edu email address. So every student at Faulkner got one and, and it, you know, it, no doubt it probably uh, damaged some students' faith, but I think most people took it for what it was. It was just kind of the ravings of a, a foolish man. But uh, one of the things that I, I've, I just ran across that in my files the other day and I opened it up and I didn't have time to look at it very long, but I had kind of, I didn't recognize the file name and I opened it up and as soon as I opened it up, I, I saw the the header of the email where I had forwarded it and copied it from uh, Jason Chesser, Frank Chesser's son. And then I knew what it was, but this was the first thing that was in there. He says, you know, you Christians that want to defend the Bible, let's talk about this. You cannot defend this discrepancy. So what about it? You know, on the surface, you look at that and you say, you know, okay, that, that's a problem. But here's, here's, the, here's the answer to that. It comes down to linguistic data of the Hebrew. This, these are... Uh, in 1 Samuel 7, you've got clauses that are linked in Hebrew by wall consecutives, if I'm saying that right. Y'all know I, I don't know Hebrew. I'm not a Hebrew scholar uh, at all. But, uh, and this is one of those where you talk about, you know, some time that it takes to understand these things. You've got to have some knowledge and do some digging. But they're linked by these consecutives that what they do, they bring the statements into close logical and temporal connection Basically, what it's saying is after the ark's capture, Israel endured oppression for the next 20 years. Israel lamented after the Lord, but they still suffered for that 20-year period, at which time Samuel called for them to put away their idols, which he does in verse 3. The ark had become a lucky charm, as I mentioned. That brought punishment from God. When they put away their idols, God was with them again, and then he sent them a deliverer. 
20 years, though, is not referring to how long the ark was there, but to the number of years the ark was there before God delivered his people. The ark was there much longer than 20 years, obviously. It was there at least 40 years for the entire reign of David. But the 20 years is talking about while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerem, the time was long. It was 20 years while Israel is lamenting after the Lord and yet not putting away their idols. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So that's, that's what it is. And it's, hard for, it's, it's harder for us to understand that looking at it just translated uh, rigidly into English. And, and that's just one of the nuances of translation. It's not always easy. And I, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I used to be uh, one of the foremost critics of translations of the Bible, and I, I still don't, I still don't want to just tolerate any silly, loose translation of the Bible. But at the same time, the more I have studied the translation process, the more I understand it's not easy, folks. It is extremely difficult, and so there's a lot that goes into that. And you know, I don't think I know now nearly as much as I used to think I knew when it pertains to translation. And this is one example of that. In the English, and we look at that and we say, well, that sounds like it's saying the ark was there for 20 years. But a, a person who knows the Hebrew and looks at that, it's very clear when you see that, that what it's talking about there is the 20 years is referring to how long the ark was there while they endured this persecution before they turned back to God, put away their idols, and God sent a deliverer. So I hope that explains that. That's, uh, you know, again, that's... That was a lengthy discussion in Eric's book, and that's boiling it down to one PowerPoint slide. But the point is, there's an answer for that. And, and this, this fellow, Farrell Till, which, you know, is, I think I've mentioned him before, and it's a sad story because he was a gospel preacher. He did mission work, and his, his mission work was not successful at all, and I don't know if that was a result of him or, or just no interest among the people to whom he preached, but it, it discouraged him to the point that he just gave up. Not only did he give up on preaching, he gave up on God, turned his back on God, turned his back on the church, and I don't know if he's still around or not. This was several years ago, but, I mean, he was always looking for a fight. I mean, he was as confrontational and arrogant and, and conflict-loving a person as you'll ever meet. He wanted, that's why he sent emails to student bodies if he could get the chance. He wanted to pick a fight with anybody that he thought might try to defend Christianity. And several people did debate him and, and did a very good job of showing that his arguments didn't hold water. This is one that he actually had as a, in, his, in that email I looked at, a discussion with some preacher, a gospel preacher. And, and bless his heart, that gospel preacher did as pathetic a job of trying to answer this. And, and that's what we need to realize, too, is that we don't do Christianity any favors when we don't do our homework and dig and find out what is the answer to this. Uh, sometimes people just say things like, well, you just got to trust in God. Well, okay. Why, why would I trust in God? Well, just read the Bible and you'll know. You need to trust in God. Okay, but what we're talking about here is whether your Bible is the Word of God. Well, you just need to trust in God like the Bible says. Well, that's circular reasoning. And, and I can see that. It's like when the, I had two Mormons that came to my house and they wanted to study and ended up being about four of them. Uh, they brought in the big boys or something because this, this fella came in and he was, uh, he was ready to tell us what was going on, you know. But they kept saying, and I kept showing them things, and I said, look, I, I can't go along with Mormonism. I've, I've listened to what you have to say. I've, I've listened with an open mind, but I cannot go along with this because, you know, and I've pointed out some discrepancies and some errors and within the Book of Mormon and, and some, some real problems. And, and they said, you know, they, they freely admitted, we can't answer that. But what you need to do is you need to pray to God. I said, okay, well, I'll pray. Then, then what? Well, then you need to read the Bible in the Book of Mormon. Okay, but there's a problem here in the Book of Mormon that I, I cannot agree with. I, I've, I've studied the Bible, and I can't find errors in it, but I can find errors in your Book of Mormon. Well, you just need to pray. And round and round we went for about 30 minutes until I finally said, Gentlemen, I think we've reached an impasse here. And you keep telling me this circular reasoning. If I'll pray, I'll receive wisdom, and then I'll understand the Book of Mormon is from God. And yet, you're telling me that based on the Book of Mormon which clearly there are some issues here. Well, you just need to pray. I mean, that's all they would say. It was like a broken record. So we finally ended up, I mean, it was cordial, but we ended the discussion. We need to be able to answer these things and understand that there is an answer, and we need to be ready to give an answer, 1 Peter 3.15. And, and this 
Farrell Till, he, he had a discussion with this other preacher, and, and the guy did not give a, a good answer. It was not a legitimate answer. And so what happened was this skeptic, atheist Farrell Till, jumped on that. And he said, oh, here's the answer you Christians give, and then he ripped it apart. Well, it was a straw man, because that's not the answer to this discrepancy. Uh, it was, it was you know, a pretty feeble attempt, really, at that. So does that, does that make sense, everybody? Does that, does that cover that one? Um, I know probably, anybody else ever seen this one before, put out by somebody? I hadn't seen it for a while until I began studying this. Nobody's ever seen that? Or are y'all just being shy? Um, let's look very quickly at when did Baasha reign? Oh, do I want to do this? Well, we got about a minute. I thought I saw Hester over there. I thought I might have a little bit longer than that. Uh, all right, let's start it. If we don't finish it, we can come back to it next week. 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Baasha, to reign over Israel. That's 1 Kings 16. Second Chronicles 16 says in the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Well, on the surface, it appears to be a, a problem because how is the king of Israel coming up, Baasha, king of Israel, coming up against Israel in the 36th year of Asa, and yet in the 26th year of Asa, you've got Baasha's son who's beginning to reign. Well, that's impossible. So it looks like a, a contradiction, a discrepancy, but there's actually a perfectly good explanation for it, which I will give to you, Lord willing, next week. <laughs> Thank you all very much.